This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Three Lions podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. I hope you're well. If reading more has been one of your New Year's resolutions, then I hope you'll enjoy this one. Following on from the recent episode on Graham Taylor's autobiography, uh, and then of course there was the Three Lions on a Shirt book chat at the end of last year. Uh, It's all been books, 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 hasn't it? But still retaining that England theme. So if you've got some book vouchers or money for Christmas burning a hole in your pocket, just hold on to it until after you've listened to this episode. Uh, But before we get on to the main bulk of it, I just wanted to say thanks for the, the feedback on that last episode, the latest in the England Manager series. It was where I spoke with Lionel Burney, who ghost wrote Graham Taylor's autobiography. If you've not heard it yet, it's available, of course, at threelionspodcast.com or your podcast provider of choice. Really enjoyed doing that one. This series is kind of a uh, an as and when. Uh, the first one was Walter Winterbottom, and I actually looked back, and that was actually February 2021. Uh, so they do take their time. <laughs> I'm sure I won't need to tell many of you that, of course, Terry Venables is next in line. I am currently doing my research, so all in good time, that episode will appear. My word, what stories. And of course, on the England front, what's been happening? In truth, not a huge amount. Uh, The World Cup is a distant memory. The Premier League has, of course, resumed. The FA Cup is in full swing. The Lionesses are to be in action next month in the Arnold Clark Cup. Of course, I'll be bringing you a preview to that in due course. Also, just going back to the first episode of this year, I gave a rundown of all of England's fixtures for this year, Lionesses included. I mentioned about the England Supporters Travel Club. Should those be interested in going to away games, you'll need membership to that. Well, membership as of the time of this episode is yet to be announced. As and when it is, I will make a point of mentioning it, either here or on social media, wherever. I I will mention it. But just as a guide, sort of finger in the air sort of thing, The last membership for the 2021-2022 period uh, was actually announced on the 25th of January 2021. Just bear that in mind. Uh, One other thing I also wanted to say, there's a, you know, Wordle. It's the, yeah, I know some of us still play Wordle. It's it's so 2022, isn't it? Um, But Wordle, the game where you have to guess a word in five letters isn't it uh well there is an england players equivalent uh it's called ingle just search yeah e-n-g-l-e and basically you just have to guess the player's surname in six goes uh it's really good if you're into that sort of thing keeps the old gray matter ticking uh but i thought i'd give that one a little mention ingle right as i say we're talking books again Now let's welcome John Driscoll back to the Three Lions podcast. Hello, John. Hello, Russell. Nice to be here. You well? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm fit as a fiddle, actually. Everyone else seems to have some kind of cold or lurgy, but no, I'm, I'm, I almost apologise to report I'm, I'm fit as a fiddle. Good stuff. Now, you're a football commentator, um, experience on TV and radio. You, you write for Saturday Comes, Football Hispania, Sky Sports, BBC, the, the list goes on, Radio 5. And you've also been on the podcast as well before, um, because we we spoke back in 2020 about a book you wrote 
the 50 football's most influential players. How did that go? Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm rich. That's why I live in the Bahamas now. Yes. <laughs> um, I, 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 I look back on it with great pride. Still available. Still, still buy them on Amazon. Yeah, it's great. I mean, you just don't make a lot of money out of it. It is the, it's the harsh reality of writing books in the, in the modern era. You know, there are, I think there are probably realistically as a, as a prospect for a business, there are too many sports books around. And so, Basically, there are always loads being sold, and so you just got to be happy with what you've written. Basically, yeah. and it sold a few, and it's yeah. and it and, and it was fine, and I'm glad I did it. But um, yeah, yeah, I'm 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 yeah, still working. Well, you, you obviously enjoyed it so much because yeah. you've written another one. I have. This yes. is called "Get It Kicked: The yep. Battle for the Soul of English Football." How did this yes. come about? So basically, this is it's basically what's in my head all the time this sort of stuff yeah. so as you can see uh front cover is terry butcher eyes eyes wild blood all over his head uh that was a sweden game wasn't it yeah in 1989 uh clash of heads and we end up with a goal of straw which helps us on the way to the world cup um and as you can see his shirt lo- lovely england shirt uh it's, it's yeah. turned the same color as the the saint george's cross that's on the front of the of the book so that's a contrast butcher is the contrast and then we've got trent and Bakayo Saka. It's it's old school, new school. And on the back, now these two players are far more similar. That's Jude Bellingham and Brian Robson on the oh, back, yeah. who actually think it's almost like, uh, do you ever play a football manager? It's almost, you know, when they recreate a player. Right. Brian Robson could be, the re- you know, Jude Bellingham could be the recreation of Brian Robson. Old school versus new school. Okay. So basically, if I, if I ask you, would you consider yourself old school or new school? I would say I'm... I'm just on the cusp of old school. Yeah. So, Personally. so, so the whole book is is an examination of where where you are and some of the detail. So, basically, rather than just shout at each other on Twitter about it, the idea is that I basically spoke to a load of people who know a load about football. So, people in the game, people around the edge of the games, you know, statos, match analysts, um, ex ex pros who've got their their views, and people who are now coaching kids. Um, about where, where we're going. Oh, sorry, agents, Keith Hackett did a bit as well on, okay. on how, you know, the, the attitude to the physicality of the game. So all of those issues examined, because in reality, we, 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 you blurt something out. And then sometimes if you're sensible, you have a rethink about it. So for example, you can't tackle anymore. Now I'm getting to an age where I, I am now, I watch football. I think, oh, come on. That's just a tackle. Uh, but I am also conscious that. 20 years ago, people people were saying that of a different level of tackling, and you watch old 90s stuff. Watch, watch Italia 90 back again. The tackling in it, you think, how on earth do we allow that to happen? Some of it, you know, so some of the change is good. So it's, it's, it's essentially, to, to, be, to be quite highfalutin about it, it's modernism. So are, are, is, are all the changes that we're making, are we making them consciously or are we just drifting into them? And which ones are actually good, such as you're not allowed to kick a player out of his career anymore, mm. and which ones have gone too far? So, for example, how do you want your players to be? Now, it's pretty uncontroversial, I would say, to say we want better technical players. I don't, don't think anyone would argue against that. No. But um, there is a line where people will draw, and some of the some of the people in the book definitely draw it, at the whole playing out from the back. When you're under pressure of a high press, didn't see much of that at the, at the, at the World Cup. There wasn't a lot of high press going on, but in club football, all the time, all the time. And kids football, I start with a story from kids football. I watch a lot of kids football where a team keeps on the one team is high pressing and they're good. And another team is playing out from the back and they're not good. And it's 10 nil, 10 dear. minutes into the game. Oh, <laughs> and it's all right. Okay. Okay. I found the line and you've crossed the line. <laughs> right. At some point, you've got to stop and consider what you're doing. So that's the the whole idea of the book. Stop and consider where modern football is, where English football is, and just ask some questions. Are you happy with where it is? Well, okay, case in point, and I'm going to go back to the the World Cup and, unfortunately, England's exit to France. Mm. Shortly before France took the lead, there was a... Tackle, and I say in inverted commas, on Bakayo Saka, which mm. took up pretty much half of half time on on ITV's um, sort of analysis. As England fans, a lot of them were saying it, it was a foul. It was a foul. I looked at it almost with this 
old school view mm. of it, it wasn't it wasn't a foul if in the past that would have no one would have drawn attention to it how, how did you see that as <laughs> well it's a, it's a good example it's it's a modern foul isn't it yeah in today's yeah. game you normally get a free kick for that and what more um saka uh, is this is, right so this is where you end up saka too honest if because right. he, he tries to stay on his feet, doesn't it? But he puts his hand down, doesn't he, on the ground, yeah, and re- and re- and tries to recover. But by then the ball is lost, and France go on and score a goal. Doesn't lead directly to the goal. It's a great shot, isn't it? Let's be honest. Yes. You, you, you know, it's a it, he hits it through Bellingham's legs from what, thirty yards out. So fair enough. But yeah, so you could say, you know, should we be more cynical? Should Saka have thrown himself on the ground and screamed? Nobody likes that, do they? No. It's it's an interesting one that, and as, as I say in the book, in the in the pandemic when the stadiums were were, were empty, yeah, we suddenly heard the the blood curdling screams that they let out. Now, when there's a crowd, you can't always hear it. All this screaming that they do now, nobody likes it. Everybody hates it, and yet <laughs> it's a fair point. If if Saka had done that during the uh, the World Cup, you know. Would would things have worked out differently? Yeah, so I think yeah, I think it's a modern foul. It's not, that's so I think they are usually given uh, these days. But at the start of the Premier League this season, everyone was saying, "Isn't it great that they've just upped the the threshold for a for a foul a little bit?" Um, and I, I I agree with that. I, th- I I do want the threshold for a foul just to be a bit higher than where it's been in recent yeah. years. I'm not talking about whacking people from the back again, no. you, you know, or smashing people and Vinnie Jonesing people and all of that stuff, but there are times that you just see it's, that's just a tackle. It's a tackle. He won the ball. It's not a foul play on. Yeah. So we're part of the the book. Obviously, you wrote it prior to the the World Cup, and and one of the angles you you looked at it was can England win the World Cup? What's the differences between sort of then and now and, and going forwards? Yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? Because because obviously any football book you sort of taking a snapshot in time, and you're opening yourself up to um, uh, events making a, a fool of you. So I, I I cleverly wrote it. So I, I, actually, when I wrote it, with the possibility in mind that England could win the World Cup, so yeah. I didn't want. But I don't, I, I'm not in a negative place about English football. I'm generally positive with some reservations. Is where I am. So I think that we have a set of players who are capable of winning the World Cup. I'd put it that way. Yeah. Now, I think when Greg Dyke came in, he set that, um, he put the clock, didn't he, and all of that. I think that's nonsense. That whole England must win the World Cup to be on the manager's list of successes and failures. Because as we've seen at this tournament and at every tournament, luck plays a huge part. You play, what, seven games? You play three. Germany played three games. I know. I don't know if you believe in XG and all of that. Germany had the best XG differential in the in the tournament after three games. They just missed some chances, basically. And so, are you sacking the manager on the basis of that? You know, a club manager wouldn't be sacked after three games. Or so, it's just very harsh judgment to just. So, you, I think you're looking at the the overall picture, whether the FA is succeeding or failing. Is are you equipping the England manager with a good enough set of players in depth? That we can go to the World Cup and think, you know what, we can win this. We are we are as good as anybody. Now, I would actually say, I think France is probably the only country with greater depth. And I don't just mean the squad they took to the World Cup. I mean, when you look around European club football, you see some very good French players here, there and everywhere. Uh, Brazil have got terrific depth in attacking talent and some maverick talent that we don't have, which is another talking point. But in terms of are we producing lots of good technical midfielders and attacking midfielders? Yeah. So I think we're in a pretty good place. Is is was Southgate a good England manager? Has he has he been a good England manager? Yes, good. Could we improve on him potentially? But be careful what you wish for when you when you're changing managers because yep. he brings so many good qualities as well that if you think oh we'll get someone who's a better tactician. Yeah, but are you losing every, all the other many good qualities that Gareth Southgate brings with him? And the, the danger is yes. And so I think both. we're in a decent place. And I think, you know, when, when we played France in that game, I'm thinking, you know, this is as good a game as I've seen in the tournament in terms of level of play. And with a fair wind, we could have won it. So I'm not in a sort of desperately unhappy place about where England uh, are. I think we're doing okay. I think there are gaps in how we develop players. And I think we could probably be a little bit 
more ruthless at the top end, at the top end of the England game, and basically <laughs> play a little bit more like Argentina sometimes, and and perhaps win a bit more. Oh, play a little bit more like Argentina. That's a uh, yeah, that's well, a, it, a topic. Yeah, well, put it this way. I mean. The, the, Analyzing Argentina technically, obviously you've you've got Messi. We don't mm. have Messi, so uh, when I say that, I, I'm, I play. Uh, I'm, I'm saying, do we play a bit more with a snarl on our face? And if I say, on they one England player who plays with a snarl on his face? And I think he's our best player at the moment, Jude Bellingham. Yeah, I think he goes around, doesn't go around kicking people because no. it's, it's it's you know time has moved on. But boy, he goes. But he's in the referee's face. He's in the opposition's face, uh, positive and negative. So when Harry Kane missed his penalty, Jude Bellingham was the first there with his arm around him. Yeah. A proper leader, a proper win at all costs, a proper, you know, he's furious when he walks off the pitch if he does, if he hasn't won the game. And I, I, I like that about Jude Bellingham. And there's a slight danger. Again, it's another theme in the book that we are producing the whole safeguarding, um, uh, well-being world of academy football. There's a danger that we're producing a really nice set of young men. Who's against that? It's, it's a hard thing to moan about, isn't it? That there are such a nice set of young men. Sometimes you just need to be, be have a little bit more grit, a little bit more in your face. So that's that's another theme of modern football. I mean that that's of surely down to their sort of background as well. I know Jude Bellingham yeah. obviously grew up in sort of Birmingham. I, I don't really know. Sort of the well, region of Birmingham, but it's... so he's, he's from Stourbridge, um, Jude Bellingham, and right. he one of the guys I spoke to, Matt Whitehouse, who's a, who's a, a coach. He's now at Coventry, and a, and, a, and he blogs on on football coaching and development. So he knew of Jude growing up. So he, he, you know, because he was an outstanding player in in their scene, and he cited it long before the World Cup came around as an example of a player who wasn't necessarily what we call coachable. Everyone loves a coachable player. And coachable is basically shorthand for a nice kid who listens and works hard. And there is a real danger that as we develop the academy system, that we only look for nice, hardworking kids. And anyone with a bit of an edge to them is regarded as too much of a trouble causer. And people just don't have any patience for them. I just want hardworking kids. And it all comes down to this notion that you can just the ten thousand hour stuff that you can basically just work harder and harder and harder, get a get good set of kids in who can run fast, and we'll just train them the rest. I, I'm not, I don't, I definitely don't agree with that. I definitely think there is something a bit of grit, grit, a bit of edge, a little bit in the in the character, and and it means sometimes taking on difficult characters. Now I can imagine Jude Bellingham arguing with people when he was a kid growing up. If you want, uh, let's take another example from another country, Luis Suarez. Right. Would we have had Lewis? Would Lewis he single-handedly destroyed us at the flipping 2014 World Cup, didn't he? Yeah. You know how would we have had Luis Suarez in our England team? Yes, we'd love him. Would he have got through the English system? I don't know because he was so badly behaved. Because you know, you know what I mean. You go around biting people, kicking people, and stuff. I, I'd imagine him being thrown out of every English academy. But he came through Uruguay and he became one of the with the all time great strikers. So that's there is a little bit of danger in as as we get this very organised, very nice world of of youth football that we lose some of the awkward characters. Gaza was an awkward character. Would Gaza have made it through a modern academy with all of his issues, all of his problems? I don't know. No, I it's, think... it's hard. It's 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 it, it's hard to say, isn't it? Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I understand what you're getting at, and I'm I'm thinking now. Again, when Brian Robson, and obviously you compare Brian Robson to Jude Bellingham, and I'm trying to remember where Brian Robson started before he went to Manchester United. It's West, it's Brom, West Brom. Brom. Yeah, yeah, but he's from the North East, isn't he? He's from Chester Street. Yes. I yes. don't know how he ended up. I must say, I don't know how he ended up at West Brom's um, youth, before academies, wasn't it? Youth, youth system. Um, but yeah, it was a strange route, wasn't it? It was those were the days when it, the North East was regarded as a hotbed of football. Um, but it is in terms of support now, not really in terms of player development. I know there's the the two Jordans were in the yeah. uh, the, the England squad, but you know you'd probably say London is probably mm. the, the the biggest hotbed. But they're still spread around the country. Um, but there are still loads of good things, and we're still producing loads of good players. I just think that we've got some missing elements because everything is so everything is so organised, everything is so well coordinated. Uh, we're a little bit like Spain in the sense that they can't produce a centre back and they can't produce a centre forward, and I'm I'm beginning to wonder 
whether you know, we're, whether we're flexible enough in how we train people or whether all of the the technical work is just producing sim- very similar looking players do these things not just come in cycles i mean where you look at spain obviously mm. where they they had that cycle of such great players that they all came together at the right time to win the euros in 2008 the world cup in 2010 and and the Euros then in, in 2012, that sometimes the stars just align and, and these players that are rough around the edges sort of make it through to be part of of the winning team. And perhaps England are just on the verge of being on that cycle. I think I, I, I've got a more active view, I think, Russell. I think, I think, you've, got to, I think you've got to force it through. No. If you say it all just works in cycles, then... I mean, tell that to a Scotsman. Where, where's, <laughs> where's the Kenny Dalglish, Graham Sooners generation? They're yeah. gone. You know, the Scotland had world class footballers when I was a kid, and now they've got they've got left back who's very good. Yeah, uh, and the other one is uh, another example would be Hungary. And I, I know Hungary currently have got a pretty decent team, but they were world beaters. That you know they were regarded as the best team in the world in the fifties. There's no inevitability about the cycle coming back your way. You know, you've got to work at it. Now, as a big footballing nation with, with, you know, the depth and the breadth of football and how deeply we love it in our country, we're always going to have a chance. So we've always got a chance of bouncing back in the way that a big club can always bounce back. But you've got to work at it. And, and I think the, the, some pretty grim years, the Roy Hodgson did not have a great squad to work with 2014, no. 2016. And I think that was a combination of we probably weren't doing the right kind of things in the the precursor to the academies or the academy system before the E Triple P, and also that was, that was probably the result of the the massive expansion of foreign players in the Premier League, and we didn't respond to that. Clubs were basically just sign more foreign players, more foreign players, more foreign players. English players got pushed out. They've, they've taken action to remedy that. You've got to have a minimum number in your squad now, so that's a good thing. And we also spend a fortune on the academy system, so we remedied it to a degree. So I'm not really a big believer in in cycles because everybody because you've, it's such a competitive market and everybody else loves football yeah. and they're all trying to do other things and they're all trying to beat us and it's fair enough you, you know you, it's not inevitable you've always got a chance because we're England and we're a big football nation but you've got to you've got to make good decisions yeah no I understand what you mean there so the book. Get it kicked. As you say, you've you've spoken to to various people along the way without giving too much away from the book and and teasing people. Tell us a couple of things or people that you've spoken to and some some of the stories that they've told you. So here's one that surprised me that I hadn't really given much thought to is Les Ferdinand. When I asked him what's – so I I wanted a few stories of the old days and all of that, and and he's such a good fella. So he he gave me those, and you know, about Tony Adams and Martin Keogh and kicking him in in rotation and that sort of thing. And I said, so what would you change about English football now? And he said, I would throw the uh, uh, under-23s league right out of the window. Um, And – he wanted to go back to reserve team football. And then, cause I spoke to Les early in the, in the piece. I then put that to other, the other guys I've spoke to, spoken to in, in and out of the game. And all of the guys from that generation, all of them want reserve team football back because really? they're absolutely, cause Les, Les is obviously a director of football and he say, trouble is you and he's been through, you know, a few first team managers and his first team managers won't put a kid into the first team straight from the academy. Because he says they're not ready for it, so the loan. So obviously, the loan system has sort of developed as a as a means of of bridging that gap. But there's a, the obvious gap is just to have a level of football, you know, reserve team football is, yeah. is the word for it, where the guys who aren't playing in the in the Premier League play football. I don't know how you sign a player. I'll give you an example: Dwight Gale, who was at Newcastle and not really playing. And then he, how do you, how can you possibly assess how good Dwight Gale is? Whether he's over the top, whether he's finished, whether he's still really good and going to bang in a load of goals. And obviously he's, he's had a really a difficult season back in the championship. Why aren't they, why aren't these guys playing regularly? And then at the same time, your young kids coming through would be playing alongside Dwight Gale. Yeah. So Les Ferdinand was saying how I think his first one, he played against Jimmy Case in his first game. 
Um, and and they were all of those guys. They all had stories of when they'd gone into their, you know, I think Lee Henry played against Matt Letizia in his wow. in, in in the reserves. So you're learning a, a vast amount, and so it's a, it's another missing stage in our football development, basically. Is, is, is that is, is uh, and then the other one. Uh, so I, you know, I, I try and cover a lot. So I'll go into the grassroots at the end as well. Yeah. And, and there's all the stuff about the kids. Um, so I spoke to Matt Crocker, who designed the England DNA about how we play as, as, as an England, as a, as a nation, some of the attitudes, but I also then do a bit on the Premier League. Is the Premier League the best league in the world? I would say currently on uh, coefficient points. Yes. I think we'll do well. I think towards the end of the season will be lots of English clubs left. Um, are there things you would change about it? Boy, well, yes, yes. You know, is is it um, um, causing massive financial mayhem in the rest of English football? Also, yes. Yeah. Um, so, so I examined some of the sort of structural things, some of the some of the off field things in the game as well, and then a, a few bits about whether you just you know some of the things that might cause you to lose a little bit of love for it, like the cheating that players do. Yeah. And some of the the stats. Based stuff, the whole you know, try, try not to shoot too much, fellas, kind of stuff. <laughs> you think, right? Okay, okay. You know, there's a danger slightly that we lose that uh, football is. There's so much money in football; it's so valuable to people. It's so important not to lose that it's you end up with sort of fear-based football, which is then self-defeating because people don't want to watch that. You just mentioned stats. There are there too many stats in football. Um, I mean, you mentioned XG as well, and, and mm. asked, am I a uh, well, uh, an advocate of that, and to be honest, I, it doesn't interest me at all. <laughs> and pretty much in throughout the World Cup, there were all these stats thrown in on the the screens. Um, uh, and off the top of my head, I've forgotten sort of what what they were. Seeing the ball between the lines, and, yeah, and yeah, it's, yeah. it's stuff that yeah. is almost alien to us because we haven't really seen that before. Is it becoming a little bit too statistical based? It's a good question, isn't it? I mean, you. Mm. I think we all have our own answer to that. I don't mind it a bit. Uh, I think the stats. We always had the wrong stats for so many years, didn't we? It's like, oh, they've never lost on a Tuesday night, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> well, oh, they haven't lost to this team since two thousand and seven. When, when was the last time they played them? Two thousand and seven. <laughs> that, that kind of stat, you know, was always yep. ridiculous. Um, now you've got these guys. You've got guys. So guys with PhDs. Uh, and, and so, you know, some of the people I spoke to in the book, that clever. Uh, Liverpool employed guys with, you know, they had a couple of, one guy with an astrophysics PhD and another wow. guy with a physics PhD to analyze football stats. And obviously, Man City see this and they think, hang on. So they went and got someone who'd worked for NASA and, and, the, <laughs> and the governments and stuff to, to analyze their stats. So that's the, that's the level that the clubs are going to. And we, we, I think in the converse, there's some conversation between fans and media and, and bloggers and podcasters. Most of us haven't caught up with how much the, the, the clubs are doing it and how secretive they are right. about how much they're analyzing the football. So it's going that way. It's an interesting one as to whether you just bore the pants off people as you go. It's, it's so it's, a, it's a good question, isn't it? You're there to be a, a fan. You're there to enjoy yourself and the stats should only be to inform what we are already seeing and enjoying. One stat, one, I'll give you one case for using XG where I would love to see XG used. When a COCOM, when a striker has a chance and the COCOM says, Oh, I should be burying that. And I'm thinking, really? Cause it's, cause it, you know, there was a defender there. It would have been lashed yep. in. He has to hook his head around and glance it backwards. And you're saying he has to score that. I'd love if the XG flashed up on the screen at a 0.02. <laughs> he shouldn't be scoring. You know, that would be an amazing finish if he scored that. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of thing, isn't it? But there's a real danger that you just bore bore the living daylights out of people and john mckenzie who's who's a, a, a tactical analyst now he was working for a stats company at the time he's moved to the athletic now but he admits to me that there is a little bit of sense um that as you analyze it and analyze it and analyze, analyze it there is a danger that you lose your love of it a little bit and that's that's yeah, yeah that's definitely true yeah well I say the book is called Get It Kicked, The Battle for the Soul of English Football. It looks at, as you say, the how England are as, as a nation and, and all the things that come with it for the game. You've looked back over the past, mm. just sort of looking forward in, in the time we've got. So with the research that you've done, is it 
positive looking forwards, especially with the the European Championships of 2024 on the horizon? Yeah, I think we're in a good place. I, I, I honestly do. I think we are we're churning out players at a more reliable rate than previously. We've had good generations before. Yeah. Uh, we're churning out good, modern, technical players. Um, right. Centre forwards issue, centre backs issue, goalkeepers okay. Um, I think the next phase, I think we've got to be more tactically flexible. What you, what you can't just do is just churn out players who've all literally played the same way. So there's a danger that it's the way that, you know, when I was playing football, it was all 4 4 2. I don't think I ever played yeah. anything other than the 4 4 2. There is a danger now that every kid growing through has played where the goalkeeper rolls the ball out to the centre back who plays it to the you know yeah. that it becomes as as dogmatic as that. But in terms of, you know, we're a footballing nation, we've got a load of money, we love it and we've spent a lot of money on our academy system. If those academies are flexible enough, ruthless enough about needing to win without just without throwing all the principles out of the window and just hoofing it and kicking everybody. I'm not advocating that, but I am advocating being flexible, finding different tactical solutions so it's not all the same teams playing the same way, then I think we've got a good chance. Yes, my I've got reservations about the Premier League being dominated by American money men a few years from now and, and Middle Eastern money men. Yeah. <laughs> But there's a there's a there's a cost to that as well yeah. uh, about for the England team. So you've got to be very vigilant about that. Otherwise, as we were saying earlier, the cycles won't come back round again um, if if something's blocking them. And if what's blocking them is that the clubs don't care about the England team, then that's a problem. And we have been there, and that was part of the the problem in the recent past is that the Premier League clubs didn't care basically how the England team did. And so we've got to be very vigilant and make sure that the England team stays very prominent in our list of of what we want from football. Yeah, well, there's there's a conversation that uh, that we can have another day because it's certainly not going to last uh, at well, the time we've got mm. left. The book, as I say, is called Get It Kicks, The Battle for the Soul of English Football, available through Pitch Publishing and I guess through any any good bookstore. Yeah, it's on it's on Amazon. It's on everything yeah, yeah. else. Uh, if you if you get in touch with me as well, I've got I've got a box load of them there, Russell, as well. So <laughs> get in touch with me on Twitter, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll sign one and, and send it out as well. So yeah, uh, I, I just I want people to read. I learned a load by speaking to all these people that I spoke to for this book, and so you know I would love people to just just inform that discussion about whether you're an old school or a new school, or of course all sensible people make their own decisions between the two and, and and change their minds if they if the evidence changes absolutely john always good to uh to chat and uh yeah it certainly make makes your mind tick i think what some of the things you've said there brilliant thanks russell Thank you to John there for his time and insight. His book, Get It Kicked, will certainly make you think. It may change your opinions, it may cement them, but it will, as I say, certainly make you think. Uh, always good to speak with him and no doubt we'll speak with him again in the future. Uh, if you want to follow him on Twitter, at DriscollFC, D-R-I-S-C-O-L-L-F-C. And I've no doubt that you'll hear him commentating on a game here or there in the near future. As I say, thanks always for tuning in. It is always appreciated. Don't forget, all the previous episodes can be found at your podcast provider of choice or threelionspodcast.com. And you are more than welcome to get in touch too. You can email threelionspodcast at gmail.com. That'll come straight to me. We can follow on the likes of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Always a pleasure to hear from you. I'll be back again with you soon. Who knows? Maybe talking with another author uh, about an England related book. Whatever it may be, it will be guaranteed to have that three lions angle. So until then, look after yourselves. Cheers. <laughs>